if, if you were a team boss and you had two seats to fill, who would you be signing up? Bezeki's looking good. You know, Bezeki's looking very good at the moment. I mean, you've got to look at you know what's coming. I mean, everyone's going to hang on to their top men. There's, there's no, you know, like Yamaha are obviously going to go the extra half yard to to make sure they hang on to Quattararo. Otherwise, they've got nothing. You know, I said it last week. I said it the week before. You know, Honda have Marquez, and he does on a Honda what no one else seems to be able to do consistently over the years. Now we've got a situation like that in Yamaha. Quattararo is is ruling the roost. There's, you know, Dovi and Morbidelli is the biggest disappointment. I mean, Franco Morbidelli. I expected to come back from that injury and be right there. Now, there's there's either something seriously wrong with his side of the garage. I, I don't understand what it is, and no one's going to tell us, but clearly Morbidelli still has a problem. You know, to finish where he finishes consistently is is not not bloody good enough. You know, not for him, not for them. Um, Davizioso, you can almost say, well, okay, he's a bit long in the tooth. It was a bit of, we took a bit of a punt with him. He could have come good. Um, he hasn't. Um so we'll let him go at the end of the year. That, that's where that's headed. Um, but Morbidelli is the, is the bigger concern because he was, you know, one of the great hopes and he hasn't performed. Getting underneath the skin of that is going to be taking quite a bit of doing. I, I mean, I'd like to know where that, where that is. I don't know whether you're hearing anything from around the paddock, Pete, but I'm not. I mean, injury-wise, yeah, as far as I've heard, he's, he's over that. It's done. But the problem is, injury-wise... It kind of moves upwards and it gets about here and sticks. You know, you can be one of those guys that's taken a massive clattering and you can't get over it psychologically. You know, he's still a very, very fast motorcycle racer, but he's somehow got to get out of that situation. <laughs> I don't know why I'm smiling. It's reminding me of the Top Gun film again. He won't engage. He won't engage. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> After he's had that big um, flame out, it's uh, anybody that's not watched Top Gun will have to now. Sorry, yeah, nice little plug. And I apologise in advance. <laughs> well, hang on though. So, so Bezeki and who's in your other seat? Really, really difficult. Really difficult. Bastianini, of course. Bastianini, the way he rides a motorbike, he's. I'm, the trouble is with Bastianini, and not the trouble is, he's brilliant. Um, the, the situation is with Bastianini. He's riding last year's bike. Last year's bike has all that data. I don't think they've caught up data-wise with the latest bikes yet. That, that's that's an ongoing process through the early part of the year. I think we'll see the factory, you know, Ducatis get faster and faster and faster as Gigi finally works out all the quirks in all the new tech that he's put on the bike. Um, and I think Bastianini probably benefits from the fact he's got last year's bike with last year's uh data and it's pretty much laid out for him they know where they're going with that bike straight away as soon as they get to a racetrack and bastianini rides it really really well he's got a really smooth wrist on him um but bastianini i think is 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 has got room for development as well i think he's 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 done better in motor gp than i thought he'd do from the get-go which i'm really impressed with so they'd be my two at the minute i okay. think okay hugh in racing coming to 2023 um pete got, got the money i've yeah, got the money yeah we're looking for sponsors uh if you know anybody send us send them our way uh pete go on same question to you who would you have two seats to fill who would you put in what you see is that you have one top guy as keith says so you know you, the, the factories always like to keep someone on don't they for continuity everything else so you know you have your star rider which is normally the obvious guy the guy who's performing best so if you're a prillier i unless you're tech three <laughs> <laughs> uh, we said, yeah, we factor your satellite now. I'm going with the fact. I'm, I'm pretending I've got a big budget here, Keith. So I'm going to go with the factory choice. <laughs> too, so, too expensive. Too expensive. Yeah, uh, but I mean, and then you you'd be tempted to take a punt on a younger rider. Everyone's always looking for the next young big star. It's what you guys were just talking about, isn't it? No, or should I say, nobody wants to miss out on the next young star, do they? And you know, we've seen the guys like Quadrara come in and do something amazing. As we say, Ducati, you've got a couple of these guys that might be this next big young star, the Martins, the Bastianinis, and, and you know, there's a danger of losing them. I think I agree with Keith. I think Bastianini is the safer choice of the two. Martin has the raw speed, no doubt about it, we were just saying. But I think Bastianini at the moment on that year old bike, yes, it's a more proven package, but you know, he's in he's in a, a satellite team, they haven't got as many Ducati engineers, all that kind of thing. And uh, to do what he's doing is exceptional to win two races. You know, Grassini uh, have been with Aprilia for all these years. They've come in, they've had all that disruption of losing Fausto, everything else. So I think all that combined, I think really Bastianini is he, he's got that right balance between the speed, 
but bringing the bike home and getting the results. And I think that's what, as a factory team manager, that's what they want. You know, they, they look at young riders to, to, you know, come in, put them in the satellite team, do some learning. Okay, if they fall off a bit, fair enough. But when you get to the factory team, they can't have you throwing it down the road every week because they need the points for the manufacturers, for the teams and all these, all these boring things, if you like, but they mean a lot to the factories. And uh, so that, yeah, that's who I'd go for. Yeah, I think Bastianini is the safer bet of these rising young stars. You gave me a bit of thinking room there, Pete, which is always a bad <laughs> thing to do because it takes a long time for my old brain to tick over. Nakagami, <coughs> who hasn't performed really where he should have done. Nakagami, I can see him getting replaced by Ayogura. Mm. If Ayogura carries on in Moto2 in the way that he is at the moment, based on last weekend particularly, um, you know, they, I think they're desperately looking to the sides to see whether they can find somebody in, uh, in, to, to replace uh, Nakagami. Nakagami is kind of underachieved. He's not made that podium that he was expected to do for some time. Um, Maybe he's weak as well. And if Ayagura carries on in Moto2 in the manner that he is, I can see them replacing uh, Nakagami with a Moto2 man. Well, there are certainly a lot of cracks uh, up and down the Moto GP grid, aren't there? And lots of good performances from the Moto2 side of things as well. Um, and let's pick up Keith, shall we, on, on Ayagura, as you were mentioning, uh, potentially touted uh, to replace Taka Nakagami, performed excellently in the Moto2 race, didn't put a foot wrong, really, he controlled the race um, from start to finish uh, to dominate. Special kind of a race, I would have said for I, uh, you know, like from the lights out, no one could touch him, couldn't put a glove on him, controlled it, as you say, from the front, I mean, what more, and not a mistake, I didn't see a mistake anywhere. Uh, really, really good ride from him, difficult to understand, you know, where he'll go from, disaster for the Brits, of course, I, I actually, Ayogura was brilliant, as brilliant as Aaron Canet was brave, tough, superb. To finish second with that injury from the week before is remarkable. You know, around her ref, yeah, you, you, the, the, when you've got a motorcycle, when a motorcycle is traveling quite quick through corners, when you've got lots of, you know, switchbacks and the like and you've got a lot of momentum in the wheels which which makes it harder to get from side to side to to sometimes get it where you want to get it um Mugello for instance is very very difficult from side to side because they're traveling at such high speeds the gyroscopic effect of wheels makes you have to put more input into it and so I think sometimes we underestimate just how much a rider has to put through the the handlebars to make those bikes go where they go so for Aaron Cannon to finish second in the way that he did was brilliant and then, of course, you've got the, the disasters that befell, quite literally, the likes of Dixon and um, and our mate Sam Lowe's. You know, like, just a, an awful situation for the, you know, Sam Lowe's is a potential winner around her any day of the week. Um, so for him to be out of that was a disaster. Jake, you know, what can I say? Unfortunate. And, and I'm his going fault. Any further than that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not laying, I'm not laying any criticism here at all. <laughs> there ain't any coming from me. Yeah. I'm myself. That's what we got Pete for. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, talking about, just go back to the front of the, the race there, Ayogura. If you, uh, nice if you nice sort of, swerve. Well, <laughs> if you sort of squint your eyes a bit, you can almost see a, a Danny Pedrosa sort of shape on a, on a Repsol Honda. I don't know, because he's a very small guy, isn't he, Ayogura? And he, he hangs off the bike and it was very smooth and... I thought it was a massive race for him. Obviously, his first win in any kind of Grand Prix class. So, I mean, I mean, if he can do that, even I would say one more dry win this year, and and for me, beyond doubt, he deserves to be on a satellite Honda next year. Um, yeah, as far as as far as the Brits, what a shame. I mean, you've got to believe Sam was easily on course for a podium. I think he was in fourth, closing on Arbolino, his teammates, and and yeah, you know. We've said it before that in this year where there's so many new winners, was was that the fourth new winner, Ayagura or something, or the fifth I think that we've had this year? I mean, it's it, it really is a new sort of clean sheet of paper almost in terms of the talent. But you've got guys like Lowe's that that potentially can lever their experience and and try and be up there every week, and that's the last thing you need is to fall like that. So disastrous in terms of of, of sort of the point situation, and 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 yeah, Jake seemed to be very angry with uh, Fermin Eldegay. I, I, I I don't, he didn't seem to do, Aldegay didn't seem to do that much wrong to me. I, I mean, there seemed to be a bit of space there, but there we go. Let me um, let me just say that um, the Dixon Aldegay uh, coming together, even though I'm not going to take sides at all, um, 
It was good to see that Dixon and Aldiguer was treated in the same way that um, Miller and Mia were treated when Miller ran underneath Mia mm. in Portugal. Um, no action, no further action was taken, deemed a racing incident. Where these things get really, really tricky is when you have inconsistency in the way the rules. If, if Dixon had got a, a, a penalty for that, it would have felt to me like um, Miller should have had one in Portugal. It was a very similar thing. It wasn't sort of a the, the uh, Darren Binder situation that we had in Portugal a, a, a last year, was it? Or the year before, I can't remember now. But whichever one where he took out for Gia, was it? Um, came from too far back, bouncing into them all and, and skipped with them. Um, that where he did get a penalty for that. I mean, it's a fine line that the stewards have to walk all of the time. I mean, it's a very, very tricky thing. But I, I was kind of half pleased that, that, that the consistency seemed to come from race direction in that um, Miller didn't get a penalty for wiping Mir out as a racing incident. Dixon didn't get a penalty for wiping out again. They saw it as a racing incident as well. Although I would have said slightly more borderline. <laughs> well, that's as far as I'm going. <laughs> Well, consistency from the stewards, at least. That's always a, a positive sign, I think, isn't it? Um, well, at the end of the Moto2 action, it's uh, Vietti still on top, uh, ahead of Iger and Tony Arbolino, of course, uh, now in the top three of the standings. Aaron Kinnett and Joe Roberts, top five. Jake Dixon uh, down in 12th. And Sam Lowe's uh, just skirting into the top 10 in the uh, standings at the moment. So uh, they'll be back in action in France. Uh, Pete, Moto3. And it was his Aaron Guevara on home soil who rode around the outside at Lorenzo Corner to win uh, the Moto3 Grand Prix as the race, well, it really went all the way to the line. As usual, Moto3 providing some of the best action on the Grand Prix Sunday. Um, final lap, it was the, the front five sort of pulling clear and then hell for leather in the end. What you've got to remember is it's a Lorenzo corner, which I always find quite funny because it's where Lorenzo got punted a few times uh, at the end of races. So the, they named a hairpin after him, which doesn't seem really quite fair to me, considering the quality of Lorenzo through fast corners. I always thought that was a, a missed um, named corner, really. I, someone was taking the mickey out of him. Although Lorenzo this weekend was declared a MotoGP legend as well, which is a good thing. So Jorge, five times a world champion, as he will tell anyone that will listen. And it, it, it's, it's great to see him recognised as the great that he is. Now, if you remember on Jorge's helmet, he had that arrow, that red arrow that goes around. And the, and the word something like in Spanish, and I'm going to get crucified for this because I do not speak Spanish, por fuera, which means round the outside effectively, because that's one of his biggest moves that he made in his career, round the outside to, to do the business. So... Um, the fact that Lorenzo Corner and Isan Guevara went round the outside. I mean, all those things come together for me and stand the hairs on my arms up because I'm a bit nostalgic like that. It just feels like a very, very uh, apt way to, to win your race. One of the toughest moves you can make and, and, and it all fell for him dead right. And there couldn't be a happier man, I don't think, on uh, the Jerez soil than Isan Guevara this weekend. It, well, it was an all Spanish affair, really, on the podium, wasn't it, Pete? Um, the, the front five did pull clear, and in the end, it, you know, with Sergio Garcia in second as well, Jaume Messia uh, stealing third, Dennis Onchu, really the big loser in, in that final lap. Yeah, almost a repeat of last year. He'd lost out at the final corner last year as well. So, yeah, really unlucky for Onchu. Uh, yeah, as you say, went into the final corner fighting for the win and came out of it without even a podium. So, yes. He's too big. Yeah, I mean, this is this is what's being said. He's just too big. He I needs mean, to be a motor too. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he's, just, he's, he's, he's there or thereabouts performance-wise, but he's just too big a lad. He needs to move on. He needs to be Moto2 next year. Well, well it, perhaps he will be promoted. Um People to look out for a little bit further down, uh, opposites, although Scott Ogden, another good run of form, top Honda, um, top 11 for most of it, but then I think he just got pipped at the end, didn't he, and, and went down to 12th or 13th, I think, in the end. Um, and then on that's the flip. A, that's a big deal, Harry. Yeah. Top Honda is a big deal. You know, when you consider the people that were behind him on Hondas, um, I think Scott Ogden has, uh, you know, Michael Laverty has, has, has managed to dig out a real gem here. Um, I think Scott Ogden is, is is somebody that's, you know, Josh Watley, I feel a bit sorry for. He was withdrawn in the end. He had a bit of a big off and uh, rang his bell. But um, Scott Ogden is is absolutely doing the business. I wonder if we're going to see Michael Laverty, you know, expand his team. That would be the thing for me. I wonder if we're going to see 
<clears throat> the thing about Michael is he's so incredibly quiet and yet so incredibly clever that he, he, he just, he's one of these guys that you can't, <clears throat> excuse my throat, by the way, folks, if you listen to me coughing away, it's, um, um, so Michael Laverty really has got one of those situations where I can see him becoming a real, you know, proper team principal. You know, he is a proper team principal anyway. Sorry, Michael, if you're listening. Uh, Motor 3 is a proper team, by the way. But And he stepped in at the last minute to, to produce this team. You know, I get the feeling, though, Michael is he's on the very edge of holding it together at the moment from a broadcast, from a team, from a management point of view. I just feel that he's spread a little bit too thinly. You know, I was listening to him at the weekend and his commentary just felt a little bit more on edge, just a little bit like he'd got a lot going on in his rather large brain. And at some stage, I can see Michael having to make a decision over whether he is going to be a broadcaster with all the commitments that takes. And there's quite a lot of commitment to that time-wise, or whether he's going to be able to to move, step back and and become a full-time proper team manager where he has to be they're looking after everything that's going on. I mean, it could be argued that he's, you know, he's obviously got Taylor McKenzie in there. That's that's his underling, if you like, that's running the team day to day wise. But there's nothing like having someone as sharp as Michael instantly available for every decision that's being made. And I think that 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 will be the next progress that that Michael Laverty's team will make in that Michael will spend more time, you know, hands on, if you like. Yeah, he's there. um, But the hours of what's needed from a broadcast point of view i just wonder how much is going on in his head when he's talking with susie perry and he's working hard on on the television stuff how much his brain is is looking to the side worrying about what's going on with his team it must surely be affecting with the, with the way he's thinking mm. it's good, that's going to be an interesting development over the next year for me anyway from a from a team and a management point of view we'll have to i wish um... michael all the luck by the way he's a great guy runs a great team was a good motorcycle racer in his time um, he, he is really quite a revelation this year for me behind the scenes. And if they can keep that together, I mean, it looks like they've really, as you say, struck gold with Ogden here. And, and if they can keep that together and move up together into Moto2 and beyond, because we have seen, haven't we, guys that did really well in the junior class, they move up, but they change teams and things like that. And, it, you know, it can kill the momentum a bit in their careers, can't it? Whereas guys that are able to keep in the same group and to sort of go up with them to the to the next step of the, you know, the intermediate class Moto2, it seems to be a smoother sort of graduation. So, I mean, it would certainly be, I think, fantastic for Scott's career as well, if Michael is able to expand the team in the future. But fantastic. I mean, top Honda. I mean, that, as Keith says, that's a big deal. Foggia, where was he? 18th. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it, it's got to be... Here's one for you. Here's one for you then. Michael manages, as well as all the other jobs he's got, he manages John McPhee. McPhee's not going to be in Moto3 next year. If he gets a Moto2 team or moves on to Moto2, maybe McPhee has got a place in there. Just throwing that one in. <laughs> I've got no knowledge at all regarding that. But I know that Michael and John are quite quite close. You know, McPhee could find himself out of Grand Prix next year. I can't see where else he's going to go. Um, I don't see who's going to take a punt with the, the, the dearth of talent that's coming up through Moto3 and in Moto2 already, where McPhee will fit into that. Um, so it, it kind of has a, a kind of, I don't know, a logistical kind of feel about it that if if uh, Michael was to be able to move anything into... I mean, there, there isn't the space at the moment. The other thing is, what you've got to remember, Erta are oversubscribed in all classes. You know, it's a, it's a situation where they only allow... The, 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 the teams and the classes that they have in Moto3 and Moto2 already, it has to be someone that suffers financially or is in difficulty for there to be an, opera, op, an opportunity for Michael to take over or anyone else to take over a team slot, as Michael did in Moto3, when... Patronus fell out and Michael took it over at, at short notice. So it has to be that situation before anybody can come into Moto2 anyway. Um, but it could be interesting to see whether McPhee is given a lifeline through his management um, to Moto2. I, th- I think we need Laverty back on back on the podcast to have a chat with him. He wouldn't tell you anything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, just He's looking looking at the at the standings uh, and John McPhee, you know, that's now five races he's missed. You know, that's a and we spoke about it coming into the season, did we? This is a bit make or break for him, really, isn't it? This year. Well, Le Mans, he's, he's brilliant at Le Mans anyway. I mean, it's a situation where, but Le Mans is another one of those racetracks where you get slightly iffy weather. You know, uh, 
penalty never fits the crime at Le Mans. You can make the slightest mistake and you're on the floor. Um, it, it, it's really one of those. It's a bit of a Mickey Mouse racetrack. It's, it's probably my least favourite, <laughs> even though from a career point of view, it was probably one of my highlights. But from a from a uh, from a, a track point of view, it's my least favourite racetrack. It's stop start. It's awkward. It's it's you know there's plenty of mistakes to be made. That run into the line at the end is dead Mickey Mouse, where we go across the 24 hour course and you know so on and so forth. So it's um. But it has a huge atmosphere, you know, if you're an animal and you fancy living in a tent and burning every fence that there is in the town to to set fire to, um, and, and, and you don't mind using every single hedge that you can find as a toilet, it is just an awful place. It's, it's, it's like going back to the 1970s, um, which surprises me somewhat in the run of things, but it is a classic, of course, because it is the French Grand Prix. Um, should we be at Manicourt? Should we be at Paul Ricard? Should we be somewhere other than Le Mans? Probably, but there is nowhere like Le Mans for um, for the atmosphere and for, of course, that nostalgia of the past. Well, save it's it living for you. In the save past. It for Everyone moans about Argentina, <laughs> saying that Argentina is is a nineteen eighties type style thing, but I think Le Mans is is below that personally. Well, can't wait for the insider's guide on that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really selling it. Uh, um, no, no racing uh, this weekend, of course. <laughs>